Hello and welcome to our first set of notes in the social psychology unit, which for many of us kind of wraps up this course as we prepare for um, our AP exam. So we're going to start off the unit with our set of notes on social thinking. Be sure that if you don't have the notes already that you check out um, the link that I have below this video to my Teachers Pay Teachers store where you'll find this entire unit set of paper notes that kind of guide you along. So let's go ahead and get started. So first let's talk about the big picture, which is social psychology and what is that, right? So it's the scientific study of how we think about influence and relate to one another. It is very similar to sociology if you've ever taken a course in sociology, but it is still very different, right? Similar, but different because sociology looks at groups of people and trends and statistics of groups of people. Whereas social psychology is still very much about the individual just how they are impacted in the social setting. So there's a big emphasis on social cognition. And remember when you think thinking, or yeah, when you think thinking, think cognitive, or when you think cognitive, think thinking. So these are the mental processes associated with the ways in which people perceive and re react to others, right? So how we think about those things. And it's through that process that each person creates a unique perception of reality. And couldn't then you say that therefore everyone's reality could be different, which is just kind of food for a thought there. So in your notes, I have a space for you to write down a definition in your own words of what it means to attribute really anything, something like an action, a behavior, event, etc. What does it mean to attribute? So go ahead and pause and jot that down and then you can start it back up. Did you pause yet? If you haven't, make sure you do. OK, so your definition, hopefully you've got it down is probably somewhere along the lines of this, and this being our actual real um, definition of attribution. So think of your to attribute definition, and we're gonna talk about attribution in the social psychology setting. So this is the process of explaining the causes of people's behavior, including your own, by crediting, right, by finding the cause to be in the external situation, meaning external factors, or a person's internal disposition, and that being their personality or internal factors. So it's called situational attribution and dispositional attribution. So I got another space for you in the notes to do this next little simulation. So you just got an A plus on your test. Okay, let's say that you just got an A plus on your test. Woo! Go you. Now, under your definition of attribution, I want you to make a situational attribution for that good grade. And I want you to also then make a dispositional attribution for this good grade. If you don't know how to do that, just look back up in your notes about what attribution is and the two different kinds and see what you can come up with. So go ahead and pause and do that now. Okay, so let's talk about your situational versus dispositional. For your A plus on the test, if you made a situational attribution, it should have been something along the lines of, I was using my lucky pen. I got a lot of sleep that night and I had a good breakfast. Or my teacher is a rock star. Or um, my partner helped me. Or I cheated, right? Um, something like that. Hopefully not cheated, but you know what I'm saying. Um, and then make a dispositional attribution. So hopefully your dispositional attribution is something about you, like, because I'm awesome. That's why, because I'm brilliant. But then it gets kind of tricky if you were to say something like, I studied. Doesn't I studied mean it's an action and therefore like a situational attribution and that you, that wasn't your personality, but you could say that I um, made the choice right? I, I am a good student, right? That would be dispositional. So there is kind of a fine line there in the difference. Okay, so another little simulation here. Go ahead and close your eyes. And I want you to visualize yourself driving in a car. And let's say that you are driving down a super busy street in your area. Um, maybe you don't have one of those. So think of like the busiest city you know of or have ever been to. It's super jam-packed rush hour traffic and you're on your way to work and you're in the right side lane trying to turn right and someone comes up on your left, cuts you off 
comes right in front of you, doesn't turn on their turn signal and turns in front of you to where you have to slam on your brakes to not rear end them. Whew, blood pressure might be roaring right now, but how do you react? And I do want you to jot that down. How do you react? What do you scream at the other driver in most instances? So go ahead and write that down. And then I just kind of want you to reflect on what attribution you made. And most likely you said, you jerk, or something like that, right? Well, isn't that then dispositional? Because you you are saying essentially in whatever you scream at this driver why they're doing it. So is your explanation based on, let's say, an unanticipated emergency? Well, his wife was like giving birth to his child in the passenger seat, and so he really had to hurry. That would be situational. Probably not very many of you did this, and I want you to keep this in mind in the future. Or was it his selfishness? He's inconsiderate. He's an awful driver, right? That's dispositional. And this leads us to the fundamental attribution error. This is the tendency to over-attribute the behavior of others, so when we're talking about other people, to internal or dispositional factors, like their personality. Okay, so when it comes to our own behavior, we're much more aware and sensitive to how our behavior changes with different situations. So if we were to cut someone off, it's because I'm late for work or no one would let me over, right? There's always a situational thing as to why we do something. But then as soon as someone does oftentimes the same exact thing to us, it's because they're a jerk or they're an awful driver. It's dispositional and that is fundamental attribution error. The other kind of side of that, where we then talk about our own behavior. So fundamental attribution error most of the time is talking about others' behaviors and coming up with that dispositional attribution. But self-serving bias is not really the opposite, but definitely related. The tendency to attribute your own successes to internal disposition, but your failures to external or situational. So often this comes into play when we commit the fundamental attribution error. So let's say if you get an A on the test, it's due to, because I'm amazing, right? That's a dispositional. But if you get an F, it's because my teacher is awful, right? It's because the AC in the classroom wasn't working that day and it was like a 500 degrees. So of course I'm not gonna do well on that test, right? So when you succeed, it's because you're amazing. When you fail, it's because of other things. Okay, let's talk quickly about attitudes and simply it's how we feel about something, right? So our feelings and beliefs that predispose us to reactions. And social psychologists that they're made up of, they say that they're made up of three things. Cognitive, so thinking. Affective, which is your feelings and emotions around an object. And behavioral, the way that you act toward it. So if someone is nice, we may feel kindness toward them and act in a friendly way. So all three things coming into play in what our attitudes are. Well, let me ask you something. Do you believe your attitudes determine your decisions and actions? So for instance, if you have the belief, the attitude that asparagus is disgusting, your behavior probably follows that up with, I don't eat asparagus. So yes, of course, attitudes lead to actions. So there's two routes of persuasion and that your attitudes kind of guide your, your decisions. There's the central route of persuasion, which is direct, right? So attitudes change when interested people focus on the facts, the evidence and the arguments and respond with favorable thoughts. So I'm choosing a Capital One card because they give me great miles, right? Like flight miles, right? Whereas peripheral route of persuasion is indirect and our attitudes change when people make snap judgments on incidental cues, like the attractiveness of a speaker. For instance, I'm changing my credit card because Jennifer Gardner is my idol and I think she's wonderful and therefore I'm getting a Capital One card. A little different, right? It's not because of the card, it's because of her and that's indirect or peripheral. So attitudes also influence actions if, and these are important to get down, that outside influences on what we say and do are minimal. So as long as there are no outside pressures, we generally follow our attitudes. It's, it's easy to, therefore we do. And if the attitude is specifically relevant to the behavior, like the asparagus thing, I don't like it, so I don't need it, right? It's really tied together 
um, ni nicely. The more specific the attitude to the action, the more likely they are to match. So your attitudes like the asparagus one, your attitudes about running a mile a day are going to predict whether or not you run to exercise. I hate running. Therefore, I don't when I exercise. And then also if we are keenly aware of our attitudes. So when we know and are conscious of and thinking about and debating those and all of that, we're more true to ourselves. Here's the next question though. Do you believe it can be the opposite? Do you believe that your actions can actually influence how you feel? And most of you are probably like, no, I determine how I feel and then I act. But what if it really is the other way around? And it is sometimes. There's a phenomenon called foot in the door. This is the tendency for people who agree to small requests to comply with a larger one and then a larger one and then a larger one. Because the idea is you get your foot in the door, right? A small part of you and then another part and then another part and then it's all of you in the door. It's kind of the idea in persuading someone. So to get people to agree to something, you start small and you build. We're going to talk about Milgram's shock experiment, but it's really important for you to know why he wanted to do his shock experiment. Um, and we're going to talk about that here in the future. So I do want you to make sure that you've made a note of that and make sure that you get back to that answer. People find it hard to say no when they have already agreed to a few smaller steps, right? I mean, that makes sense, right? Like you've been saying yes all this time. Um, and I could totally give you an example here, but I want you to come up with your own. You should be doing this in your notes, but also in class, right? Like talking about it to other people. Think of, let's say that you want to ask your parents for something. How are you going to start if you use the foot in the door phenomenon? So door in the face, right? So think of door in the face. The door is really big and it's in your face, right? So asking first for something huge, one that you know is going to be denied, which seems kind of like reverse psychology, which in a way it is. Then after being turned down, you agree that, oh, okay, yes, you're right. That was ridiculous. That was excessive. So how about this? and you ask for something less, something that you originally wanted in the first place, right? So because the person appears, because the person you're asking, or I'm sorry, because the person who is asking you, right? Because you appear willing to compromise and because the request seems modest in comparison to what you first asked for, something huge, it's more likely to be granted than if it had if it had been asked at the outset. And I changed my mind. I'm going to give you some examples. So let's say foot in the door. Okay, let's say that you want to go on a huge spring break for your senior trip. You've never been on a huge week-long spring break without your parents or without any adults. That's a big ask. So you know you're going to do this. So you start asking the summer before for small things. Is it okay if I go on... Um, a one night camping trip with just friends and it's only like a half hour away, something like that. And then the next ask is for a weekend, right? And so you do that like a couple of times. And then finally, the next ask is the big ask um, where you go for a week, something like that. Whereas door in the face is you really just want to go for a weekend away with just friends with no adults. So you ask, can I go to... Timbuktu, right? Like across the globe with no adults for a week. Can I do that, please? It's going to be like $4,000. And parents are like, that is so ridiculous. No. And you're like, all right, fine. You're right. That's kind of ridiculous. So how about a weekend, like three states away, where, wherever that might be, to the beach that's like a four-hour drive, something like that, for a weekend. And they're like, okay, I think I can work with that, right? You go huge that you don't really want to make your actual ask seem more reasonable. Finally, we're going to talk about cognitive dissonance theory. And this is when people become aware of the inconsistency. So think of dissonance. Dissonance is difference, right? So inconsistency is being a difference between your attitudes and your behaviors. And there's an inconsistency there between your attitude and behavior, like I hate running, but here I am running or vice versa, right? Um, I love running, but I don't do it. Something like that. They become anxious and they're motivated to make them consistent. Um, this was kind of the idea of Leon Festinger. 
um, and some examples. So um, the first one I want to show you is this story, which I'm totally blanking. Oh, it's like fox and the grapes, something like that. So a fox sees these grapes high up in the tree and can't get to it. I don't know why, but they can't climb the tree. I don't know if fox can climb or not, um, but they can't get to it. So he says to himself, right, his belief is I want the grapes. But the behavior is I can't get to the grapes. I can't have the grapes. So what am I going to do? I'm going to change what I can so that I'm not anxious about that. And I'm going to say those grapes have probably been there for a few weeks anyway, and they're probably spoiled or they're poisonous, something like that. I'm changing my belief, my attitude, so that there's not an inconsist inconsistency there and I feel better. So because the behavior is difficult to change, people usually reduce the difference, that inconsistency, by changing the attitude, the inconsistent attitude. Because what's easier to change? How we think or how we act? What we believe or our habits? Unfortunately, it's what we believe. And then finally is the Zimbardo Stanford Prison Experiment. And what he, Zimbardo did, who's still a dude who's around and kicking and bringing lots of great things, you should totally catch his TED Talk. Um, so it's all about role playing, affecting attitudes, and the impact of the situation and our behavior changing with different situations. So the experiment, and I'm going to try to give this to you quickly, is he's at Stanford University. He's a professor there in the psychology building. And over the summer, um, for two weeks, he gets a pool of students and randomly selects um, or randomly assigns half of them to be prison guards and half of them to be prisoners. And he works with like the local police station and does like a mock arrest of each of the prisoners. The prison guards are given a uniform and glasses and like a billy stick and told go do like there's your prison guard go with it um, but not given any other directions and the prisoners are just you're a prisoner you live here you eat here you are here for two weeks and they consented to that they actually had to end it within a few days i believe it was like six days Ooh, i should check on that but they had to end it because zimbardo himself and he's quoted in saying that i was so consumed by my role as a prison ward that his wife his significant other at the time said, Phil, you're Phil. You're a professor at Stanford University. This is an experiment. You are not a prison ward and you're making decisions as if you are. And the absolute atrocities these prison guards, I'm sorry, college students were committing were absolutely awful. You should totally look into all of the things that they did. But the bigger thing or the bigger idea here is that they did things the prison guards did, the college students did things that they never would have done unless they were in that situation. So how does that apply to our lives? Because I don't know about you, but I'm not going to be in some two week experiment at Stanford University acting like a prison guard. But you better believe that we each are in different situations throughout our lives. You're at school, you're at your, your church, your place of worship, right? You're in sports or other activities and performances. You're at home, you're with friends, you're with family. And in each of those, you are impacted by the people around you and the situations that you are in. And most of the time, there is not huge consistencies in our behavior there, but there are slight ones. So when there are huge differences in those atmospheres and situations, our behaviors follow suit. And we are so impacted by that situation. So the results, and I've kind of, I just kind of put in words what I've been saying here, but the prison guards and even Zimbardo himself admitted that they were so consumed with their role that they acted in ways they never would have outside of that role, showing the impact of the situation on how we behave. And we can't say that we are just um, exempt from that. We can't say that. We can't say that we are exempt from that and say, well, well I wouldn't have done that because research shows that you very much would. So that concludes our notes on social thinking. Um, make sure to catch my next video and I would love it if you'd subscribe to my channel and everybody have a great day.